Yes. Go with me to Galatians. Where am I going? Yeah. <clears throat> Galatians. We're going to look at Galatians. We're going to go to chapter 3. <coughs> Galatians chapter 3. Paul starts out in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently or obviously and openly set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, obviously, the inference here is that it's by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? He, therefore, that ministers to you in the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that... Now listen to this. I'm going to take this piece by piece. I, I, I like... We do a lot of topical teaching. But I like to do it expositional as much as possible so you can see the full context. All right? Because context means everything. Notice what he says. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. You hear that? God counts the children of Abraham as being those who are of faith. In other words, just because you're of some human lineage does not mean that God counts you as the children of Abraham. You understand? Now, in the world, we have two physical lineages of Abraham. We have Isaac, we have Ishmael. Okay? Out of Isaac came the Hebrew race. Out of Ishmael came the Arabic race. Right? We know that what, when God promised Abraham a child, Abraham didn't want to wait for God to accomplish it. So they tried to accomplish it in the flesh. And because of that, Ishmael was born. Right? And because of that, all the trouble that has come between Ishmael and Isaac now is still going on, all because they got too in a hurry. Alright? Now, here's another thing you have to remember. Almost every time God gives a promise, <clears throat> what happens is people get antsy about it and end up doing something that produces an Ishmael. Alright? Ishmael was a child of the flesh. Isaac was a child of the spirit. You understand? Now, that was then. I have to go even further. Okay? Watch. He says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before... Now you, you, said, you notice it says he, he was going to justify the heathen through faith, not through law. Even though God gave the law, he knew the law was not going to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. Right? That's why the law was temporary, but the gospel is eternal. Alright? <clears throat> he preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. You hear that? Those that be of faith are blessed with Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, he's saying, because the, the law, if you don't keep every piece of the law, then there's a curse that comes because you break the law. All right? Then he says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. So he said, look, even if you kept the law, you're still not going to be justified by God. 
the law cannot justify men. The just shall live by faith. All right? And the law, now watch, verse 12. And the law is not of faith. See, the law is based on works. The law says, I know I'm right with God because I did everything just right. Well, there's no faith in that. There's just works. And if it's by works, then you can boast and say, God will bless me because I did this. That's the problem with fasting and prayer the way it's taught in the church. Fasting and prayer in the church is works-based, not faith-based. Right? And that's what happens. Well, how'd you get so anointed? Fasting and prayer. It's what I did. You understand? Most prayer and even fasting in the church is nothing more than a manipulation and people trying to manipulate God. They're trying to twist God's arm and they're going to do this until he gives them what they want. It's like a child throwing a temper tantrum. I'm going to keep throwing my temper tantrum until I get what I want. All right? That's how prayer and fasting is used in the church mostly. Prayer and fasting is not to move God. It is to change you and peel away your layers until what, what God has put in you is released out of you. But if you keep trying to twist God's arm and you think that's what it's doing, then that's the result you're going to try to get. Then you're not going to get anything out of it. You understand? Except hungry. All right? I always tell everybody, God did not institute fasting so he can hear you bellyache. Literally or spiritually. Okay? And the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen. Being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Why? Next verse. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles... Through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you hear that? Now watch. Look at that. Let's read that verse again, but take it piece by piece. That the blessing, that's singular, not plural. Right? Not the blessings, the blessing. Right? Now, the blessings are the things that God gave Abraham. The blessing was what God said to Abraham. Right? And he said that what God said to Abraham would come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Now watch, he says, and, this, and now he's going to tell you what that blessing was. Remember, see everybody's always hung up on the blessings. The real riches in Christ is not the blessings, but the blessing. You understand that? Now watch. Now he's going to tell you what the blessing of Abraham was. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit... Through faith. That's the blessing. The blessing is not things and money and riches and cattle and houses. The blessing is that we can receive the Spirit. You understand? That is the promise of Abraham. That's what God told Abraham. That was the main thing. If you believe me, if you have faith in me, if you follow me, you will be judged righteous and I will put my spirit in you. And the funny thing is, now we got everybody trying to go to the blessings, trying to look at the blessings. Oh, oh, how do I get rich? How do I get my bills paid? How do I get my mortgage paid off? How, how do I get you know, food on the table? All that kind of stuff. When Jesus said very clearly, don't think about what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what will we wear. That's what the Gentiles, the unsaved, that's what the, the heathen think about. And yet, what do we talk about in church? How do we get blessed? How do we get rich? How do we get our mortgage paid? How do we get things? You heathen? You're still thinking like a heathen. See, but you, once you understand that you get in the kingdom, that God can give you the Spirit. If you have the Spirit, if He gives you the Spirit of God, He's giving you the kingdom. If He's giving you the kingdom, you got everything in the kingdom. That means your mortgage gets paid. That means your bills get paid. That means you walk in fullness. That means you're blessed. I mean, it's, it's so easy. You don't even have to think about it. Do you realize, the funny thing is, and this proves it right here, okay? God told Abraham, you walk with me, and the blessings will overtake you. Okay, Christians are trying to get the blessings, and they're chasing the blessings. Blessings ain't overtaking them. Very few Christians do I hear, or do I know and see, 
that are going out, you know, getting every book on how to get the blessing, how to break the curse so I can receive the blessing, and all these kind of things. Blessings ain't overtaking them. They're pursuing the blessing. Isn't that right? That ought to tell you something's wrong right there. Jesus said, look, you're not going to have to concern yourself. He said, look, you seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. But what are we seeking first? The things. I've got to know how to get the blessings. I've got to know how to get my bills paid. I've got to know how to... Well, guess what? When that happens, they're going to flee from you. But when you seek the kingdom, the, the blessing will overtake you. Why? Because you're not thinking about those things. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. Honestly, this is the way we live. This is the way I live. It's, it's, and, and I'm telling you, it has never been so easy in my life. You understand? And, and I'm not saying we got money piled up. We don't. But my bills are paid, and whatever I need, it's there when I need it. People say, well, why didn't God just pile it on you? Don't need it. Right? And if he pours a whole bunch in, guess what? I'm going to have to end up paying a bunch of taxes on stuff, and the government's going to get it. <clears throat> so why, why would he pour it all on where I just got to pay it out again? Instead, as I need it, he just gives it to me as a... <clears throat> Corey Tinboom. she told a story about whenever they were <clears throat> being... Well, they were in the concentration camp. And she was so scared. And her si actually her sister and them were there. And I can't remember if it was her or her sister, but the story's the same. And they said, one of them said, you know, I, I, I don't know if I have enough strength to do this. I don't know if I have enough faith. I don't know if I have enough strength to go through this. And one of them said, do you remember when Papa, we used to go to, on train rides. And she said, yeah, I remember that. Remember how he would always hold our tickets? And she said, well, yeah, I remember that. And when we lined up to get on the train, he would not give us our tickets until we lined up. And when we started getting on the, on the train, he would give us our ticket and then we'd get on. And she said, yeah, I, I remember that. He said, that's the way it is. Right now, you don't have the strength to go through that. But when the time comes, the Father will hand, you, hand it to you. See, that's the way most, most people say, I want it now so I know when I get there, I'll have it. God says, you don't need it now. You need it then. When you get there, that's the faith part. If you had it now, there'd be no faith. <clears throat> faith is walking up to the door and saying, when I get there, I'll have the key. You don't get the key now. You get the key when you get there. You see? <clears throat> like I said, when I knew Dr. Summerall, he signed a contract for $10 million for a television station and didn't have $500 in the bank. <clears throat> Everybody else was worried. We were all thinking, because he put up different things as collateral. <clears throat> and so, you know, a lot of people were standing around going, well, well I hope we're sure we get it. And it'd be like 10 days in, and he needed it in 30 days. 10 days in, didn't have it. 20 days in, didn't have it. 25 days in, didn't have it. And everybody kept saying, <clears throat> what's going on, what's going on? And his family, oh, elderly couple, retired, called him and said, <clears throat> like on the 29th day, I mean, it was amazing. Called him and said, uh, how much money do you have for, toward that? And he said, well, I have what I need. Why? Because he's not going to say he doesn't have it because he's believing God that he does have it. And they said, well, <clears throat> here's what we're doing. That they said, God told us to cover whatever doesn't come in. And he's thinking, okay, he's talking to an elderly couple and he needs $10 million. And he still hadn't got even, you know... <laughs> Any of it. I mean, literally none of it. I think like maybe, maybe a couple of thousand dollars came in. And he's thinking, okay, well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> so they waited. So like on the 29th day, they called him back and said, how much money have you got? And, and he said, well, why? And they said, well, we know you ain't got it. <laughs> and he said, well, how do you know that? He said, because God told us to write a check to you for nine million nine hundred and eighty five thousand I mean detail and when and he said well I appreciate that but um I need it tomorrow and they said that's when we mailed it yesterday <laughs> All right and the check was there now they called him on the first day and they could have sent the check on the first day but God didn't tell him to you understand because and whenever all his staff gets around and goes why did God wait so long? He said, I didn't need it to the 30th day. He said, God's smart. He let them keep it in their bank account, keep drawing interest on it. I didn't need it. Why, why would I get it? It's just going to sit in my bank account. 
the way it is now. And when the check got there, I think it was FedEx or something like that, they came in. I remember him ripping that thing open, pulling that check out. There's that check. And he put it in his pocket, drove to the television station, and handed it to the people. Straight across. Okay? But that's the way he was because it meant nothing to him. What meant something was we got that television station. That's what meant something. And I remember him at one time somebody called and these other people wanted another ministry, wanted this television station. And he said, and everybody, people didn't, these people that owned it said, we don't want to sell it to them. We want to sell it to you. We like you. And they said, we don't want to sell it to them. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't have sold it to them either. But he said, well, if they asked, he said, who asked for it first? And they said, well, they did, actually. But it was like the same day. They just called earlier as soon as they found out it was on, on, on the market. And he said, I didn't sell it to them. He said, I withdraw my bid. And they said, but we want to sell it to you. He said, no, sell it to them. And he said, because if I defer to them, God's got something better for me. And, he, and what ended up happening was whenever he deferred to them, they bought that television station. And then another, the uh, shortwave radio station came up. And it literally was given to him. And that shortwave station is still going on now. And it covers all of Russia, covers like two-thirds of the world. And it's going on out there. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and he, he made it very obvious. That's what God had. If I had not deferred there, I wouldn't have got that. See... I've never met a man that had more of an Abraham mentality. You want to go that way? I'll go that way. You want to go this way? I'll go. I, because it doesn't matter which way I go. Because God's going to bless me wherever I go. You, know, you may need all the help you can get. So take the good thing. Right? But I got all the help I need. You understand that? If you can get that mindset, everything changes. To know why... <clears throat> just to... to, to be able to know that God is with you and whatever you put your hand to is going to be blessed. Amen? I heard Jimmy Swagger say one time, and, I, you know, God bless Jim, Jimmy Swagger, but I disagreed with him. He said, you know, our problem is that we make a plan and then we take it to God and say, here, God, here's the plan. Bless it. He said, when we ought to be saying, God, what's the plan? And it'll be blessed. And there's truth there. You understand? And, but the fact is, and, and I do believe that we have God's plan, and we're doing it. But, even if I didn't, whatever I put my hand to will be blessed. You understand? And I'll, I'll prove that to you today, as a matter of fact, some things, because I'm going to show you, it's not about being led to do things, it's about you taking responsibility and doing what needs to be done. Because there's, there's people out there, you know, that <clears throat> say different things, and, and say things like, well, you know, God is not driven by need. Okay? There's truth to that. He's not. But at the same time, we also sing the song that says, He looked beyond my faults and saw my need. And right? He sent Jesus because of the need of humanity. Amen? So there, He is need-driven in that sense. I've heard people say, well, the need is not a call. That is a lie. If you see a need, it is a call. If you see your brother needing help... That, that's, see, that mentality is what allows Pharisees to walk past the person on the, on the road to, to on the, the Good Samaritan story. Put it that way. It's that mentality of, well, I see the need, but I, that, that's not my call. That's not my calling. My calling is this. You know? My calling is to, is to teach prophecy, not, not to help a person in a ditch. All right? No, that's a lie. Every need you see, you're responsible for helping. Because you can't say, you see your brother in need and say, be blessed, be warm, and don't help him. You understand? We have this theology, we have created a theology that allows us to ignore our responsibility. And if you just go in and study moral obligation, you have a moral obligation as a human to help people. Amen? <clears throat> now, he says, where are we at here? <clears throat> yeah. Verse 12, 14. That the promise of the Spirit that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. In other words, I'm going, to, I'm going to speak humanly here for a minute and give you some examples. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuls or adds thereto. In other words, look, you, he's saying, look, you well know that if we form a contract, once we write the contract, once we agree and sign it, once it's confirmed, you can't break it 
and you can't come in later and, and add something to it. In other words, the contract is the contract. Amen? It's settled. Now, watch this. <clears throat> now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, that's plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. You hear that? Now, if you really understand this whenever we finish here, I promise you, it's going to make a difference in you and the way you look at things and even in the world today. It's going to make a big difference. Okay? Notice he said, when he talked to Abraham and he made the promises to Abraham, he said, and to thy seed. Singular. Not plural. And he said, he said to thy seed, and the seed he was referring to, which is Christ. Right? So when God spoke to Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless Christ. Right? You and your seed, not seeds, seed, Christ. Now that means that every seed before Christ was not who God was talking to that would receive the blessing. You hear what I'm saying? So all this, okay, when I get done, I'm going to send this tape to John Hagee. Alright? Because we need to understand, God is not looking on the flesh, but in the spirit. Alright? He says, now watch. Verse 17, And this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after the agreement, the covenant that God made with Abraham, that cannot disannul. Right? In other words, he said, look, God made a covenant with Abraham. Technically, God was making a covenant with Christ. But he used Abraham as the human representative because Abraham was an ancestor of Christ. And that's who Christ wanted to come through. So rather than waiting all those years until Christ showed up and letting all those people just perish, he made a way that they could come into it in a kind of a, as we would say, a grandfather type clause that they were grandfathered in. Okay? Now, because of that, he said, after God made a covenant with Christ through Abraham, 430 years later, God instituted the law. And the big deal then was made on the law. And the, the Pharisees and everybody in Jesus' time and even during Paul's time, it was all about the law. They knew Abraham was their father, but the big deal was the law. Right? And he said, look, you're making a big deal over the law, and the law did not change the covenant that God made with Abraham or with Christ through Abraham. He said, now, the, the Christ, right, is the end of the law for righteousness for all who believe, right? Now, and he, watch this, so I have to, wait till I get there, I'm getting ahead of myself here. He says, let's see, yeah. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years <clears throat> after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Right? The law that was put in later did not change the promise or make it of none effect. For if the inheritance that came by way of the promise be of the law, it's no more a promise. In other words, it's no more by faith, it's by works. He says, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serves the law? In other words, if that's true, then why did God put the law in there? It was added because of transgressions. You hear that? In other words, God had to put something in there to say, okay, look, if you keep what I said, here's what will happen. If you break what I said, here's what will happen. Right? He said, because man's going to break it and transgress the law, he had to put the law in there. He, because man was going to transgress the covenant that he made with Abraham, he had to put the law in there to show the benefits and the you know, detriments to it. And now watch this. He said, the law was added because of transgressions. How long? Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now who is the seed? Jesus, right? And he said the law was good until Jesus showed up. You hear that? When Jesus showed up, the law stopped. You understand? 
Now, that means that now, even if you went back and kept the law perfectly, it wouldn't make any difference. You understand? Now, because that's not the way it works anymore. Okay? And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one. What this means is a mediator doesn't have the, the, the um, best interest of one party. Okay? A mediator has the best interest of both parties. A, a true mediator. Right? But, but God is one. Right? He says, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law, now watch this. If there had been a law given, which could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin. Why? That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Okay? But before faith came, we were kept under the law. So the law had nothing to do with faith. The law had to do with works. Right? The law was not a matter of heart. The law was a matter of obedience. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. We were shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Now you see, it is biblical to say shut up. It's right there. You, you, you're right there in the Bible so you can use it. Okay. okay. Verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Right? The reason the law brought them to Christ is they kept the law. The law revealed Christ, but the law didn't bring life. The law led them to Christ because they realized, I can't keep the law. And so, when Christ came, then they would say, you're telling me that Christ kept the law for me so that I don't have to keep the law. Now, that's not saying live any way you want, but he's saying, look, you are going to mess up. And if you mess up according to the, the law, then you were guilty of the whole law. And you were totally out of fellowship with God. But Jesus, when Jesus came, we have faith in Christ and in the fact that He perfectly fulfilled the law. So He kept the law. Now watch. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, brings us to Christ. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Right? So it, now the, the law was our schoolmaster. But after faith has come, you're no longer under the schoolmaster, right? So you are no longer under the law. Don't let people put you back under the law. For you are all the children of God. You notice it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't say all people are children of God. The children of God, you are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. The children of God are those who have faith in Christ Jesus. You understand that? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now watch. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to show you why it says that. Now watch this. I'm, this is why I want you reading it out of your own Bible, preferably, because if you didn't, you wouldn't believe it. Right? I want to make sure you know that I didn't write this. Right? It's been there the whole time. Okay? And if you be Christ's, meaning if you belong to Christ. Okay? How many of you belong to Christ? All right. Then are you Abraham's seed. But now notice, not to many seeds, but one seed, which is Christ. Right? But if you're in Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. Not many seed, one seed, Christ. When you're in Him, it's no longer you that live, but Christ that lives through you. you see, now watch this. That means, like I said, how many of you are in Christ? But now, and, it, and if that's true, then it is no longer you that live, but Christ who lives in you. So all of a sudden, we don't have 50 people here. We got one. Christ. You understand? You get it? Why? Because your life is hid in Christ. You get it? No longer you that live. Your life is hid in Christ. Here's why you keep having defeats. You keep distinguishing yourself from Christ. 
You talk about your anointing, your gift. You understand? Your faith. Will your faith fail? Or do I have enough faith? What does it matter? The faith that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not my faith. It's the faith of the Son of God. Can the faith of the Son of God fail? Don't think so. You see? But if you, if every time you go back and you pull yourself out of Christ and you try to distinguish yourself as somebody, what you're saying is, I'm separate from Christ, I'm anointed, I have my own anointing, or I have John Lakes or somebody else's you go get in line and somebody puts their hands on you for. And I'm, I'm this, I have this gift, and you're trying to make a name for yourself. And your name doesn't work. You understand? What we do, we do in the name of Jesus. Quit pulling yourself away and saying, I'm using his name. You're not using his name. Because the Bible says that he has... And this is where it gets good. Okay? He says that he has named all things in heaven and earth... He's pulled them into that name. And he has given them that name. You understand? So, the name of Jesus is not just the name of Jesus. It's your name. Because you're in that family. Isn't that right? Women, you know, you're, you didn't always have the same last name you got now. Isn't that right? But that doesn't stop you from writing a check with that last name, does it? You, and, and honestly... And don't let your husband know, but I know you write checks without telling him. Right? He may find out later. Okay? But do you realize, according to the government, according to the law, you don't have to ask him. Sorry, men. I had to tell him. Okay? <laughs> All right? You understand what I'm saying? According to the law, when you received that name, you didn't have to ask him from then on when you signed that check with that name. You understand? Why? Because it's your name. See, then you think you're using the name of Jesus like, okay, I'm going to use your name. I hope, that's, I hope you back me up. No, it's not just his name. It's your name. Paul said, look, you have to understand, it's no longer two. He said, I'm, I'm going to teach you something about the body of Christ. Let me see, what an example can I use? Oh, yeah, a husband and wife. Isn't that right? He said that the two become one. Yet the two don't become one because there's still two people. Right? So, in Christ, we become one. But yet, we're still a whole bunch of people. Isn't that right? But we're still one. Why? Because we're in that name. We become one. We become one in thought, deed, our, our actions, our ambitions. We become one in unity and one in purpose. You understand? Even though, we're, even though a husband and wife are still two, the Bible says they're one. And it says you'll no longer be two, but one. Well, we know physically you're still two. <laughs> So he's not talking physical. God never looks on the outward man. God looks on the heart. God says, look, two people who are married become one in purpose, in mind, in intent. And if you live together long enough, guess what? You're going to finish each other's sentences. Why? Because you know what the other one's thinking. You know, my wife hardly ever has to ask me what I'm thinking. She already knows what I'm thinking about. You know? That's the way it's supposed to be. We, should, we have the mind of Christ. It shouldn't be any question what we're thinking about or any situation we're thinking, how we're thinking about it. Right? Now watch. He says, If you be Christ, belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, now watch this, and heirs according to the promise. Now what's, what is he talking about now? He's talking about an heir. Right? And he says if, you, if you're in Christ, you are the heir. Isn't that right? So who's an heir? That'd be us, right? Are you an heir? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Can I talk you out of it? No. You're, you're sure? Yes. Now hopefully by now you know if I'm doing this, there's a reason. <laughs> right? I'm backing you into a corner where you can't get out of it, right? Because <laughs> watch, because if, if I don't do that, you won't believe this. Your, your, your human head will try to over... I, I've been talking to people about having faith breakers. You know, like a house has a breaker, you know, breakers... And, and if, if too much electricity goes through, it'll, the breaker will shut off. People have faith breakers. There, people, and it shouldn't be, because we, we quote it. Oh, all things are possible. Okay, that's true. But if that's totally true and operative in you, why isn't everything happening? Right? And the reason it's not is because you have a breaker. That you, you can believe so much, and then you shut down. 
and usually you believe according to what you've been around. Right? And you get around somebody that's doing it and you see it happening, guess what? You get a bigger breaker. And that's why, that's been our problem in the church. We've not had people we can get around that's walking in the power of God that we can get to them. Instead, you've got to stand in line and you can't get to them. I'll just leave it at that. Okay? And in reality, we're, we, were, we were not called to just talk. I'm talking about the five-fold ministry. We were called to disciple, which means close interaction. It means being accessible. It means answering questions. It means working with people, doing things like that. That's a discipleship. But if you don't see that, if you're not around it, you don't get a bigger breaker. You understand? I'm going to show you more about that a little bit later on. But the problem is people don't, they're, they don't have a big enough breaker. So whenever I, if I, if your breaker isn't big enough, that's why I've been trying to get you to this point all week. Because if, if, and if I hadn't done my job right, then when I say this and read this stuff to you, then I, if I haven't given you a bigger breaker, you're shut down because your, your carnal, unrenewed mind, the part of your mind that's still not renewed, will kick in and shut everything down. Right? So... Try to bear with me, okay? Hang on to this. So who are we talking about? Heirs, right? Now remember, chapter division is not divine. So let's keep reading right on into 4 and know that Paul is still talking about the same thing. He says, now I say that the heir... Stop right there. Who's he talking about? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, okay. That the heir, as long as he is a child... Oh, look at there. We're talking about children again. What does that mean? He's carnal, a babe in Christ, right? It means he lives off meat. It means he's a hearer but not a doer. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we learned the other day? Okay. The child, as long as he's a, the, the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant. Hear that? Though he be Lord of all. You, you see that? Now see, if I just ask you, now who's Lord of all? Jesus. Wait a minute. See, you just jump back over to your religious mind. Because uh, that same verse, we were talking about heirs. Who's the heir? You're the heir. But as long as the heir, as long as you are a child, as long as you're carnal, as long as you're not spiritual, as long as you have milk, as long as you're a hearer of the word but not doer, guess what? You differ nothing from a servant. You're just like the Old Testament servants. That means you've got to be told what to do, when to do, and how to do it. What do we hear in church? Oh, Lord, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Lord, tell me when to do it and I'll do it. If you'll move me, if you'll lead me, I'll do it. So, so what, what is the church full of? Children. Babes in Christ. Hearers but not doers. Is this right? But now we're heirs. But as long as the heir is a child, as long as they're carnal, not spiritual, guess what? They differ nothing, nothing from a servant. Even though the whole time, the child, the heir, you, is Lord of all. Is that what it says or not? I told you, if you didn't read it in your own Bible, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, it's, it's too good. Amen? Now, you say, well, wait a minute, I thought Jesus is Lord of all. See, you keep separating yourself from Him. Isn't it right? Quit separating yourself. When it talks about him, it talks about you. Why? I'll show you. Well, actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. Just hold your place right here and go with me to Ephesians. Ephesians. Remember, hold your place. We're going right back there. But I want to read this part to you. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start in verse 11. These are verses you know. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. How long are we going to have them? Verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now stop right there. Now that, understand that's not saying till we all come to know that Jesus is the Son of God. He's talking to the church. You don't get in the church without knowing that Jesus is the Son of God. Right? So he's not talking about knowing who Jesus is. He says, matter of fact, the word knowledge there in the Greek is the Greek word epignosis. And it means a full understanding, an experiential knowledge. 
What that means is this. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and until we all have the full experiential knowledge that the Son of God has. It doesn't say you're going to know who He is. It says you're going to know what He knows. Well, I read that to you yesterday. But we have the mind of Christ. But if you have the mind of Christ, you ought to know what He knows. Right? And now watch this. And we're going to come into a perfect man. That means a mature man. Okay? Un, now watch this. You're going to, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he's saying the, five, the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to grow us up until we grow up into the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right? You understand what that means? We're going to grow up to be the same size and everything of him. Now, that's not talking physical. That's talking about in the spirit. Now watch. He says, in verse 14, why, why, does this take, why does he want us to grow up into the stature of the fullness of Christ? That we henceforth, or from now on, be no more children, carnal, babes, hearers and not doers. Be no more children, because children are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Right? Why? Because you're a hearer, not a doer. And if you don't, if you're just a hearer, not a doer, you'll believe anything. And that, and this all wrapped up with what I told you the other day. You see how it's all coming back together. Everything I've been telling you, it all comes together. Now watch. He says, Cared about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. See, he's saying the fivefold ministry is to prepare you and to grow you up so that when these wolves come in, they won't be able to lead you off into wrong doctrine and take you off over into this thing. Why? Because they are... In cunning craftiness, the slight of men, they are devising schemes to take you away from Christ and to pull you off into other things, to pull you back under the law, to pull you back into everything under the sun and try to get you to do everything they can get you to do so that you'll get blessed, not knowing you're already blessed. They're, do you understand when they try to get you to send money to them for a blessing? They're trying to get you to pay for something you already have. Right here in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. But you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now that doesn't mean things. What that word says is God literally, Ephesians 1 3 says, God has said every good thing about you he can possibly say. That's what that, the word blessing, euodia, is where we get the word eulogy. It means to speak well about a person. When it says God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing, it says God has said every good thing about you He can say. Isn't that amazing? You think, well, I, I'd rather have a thing. I'd rather have a car. I'd rather, I would rather. don't want somebody just saying, well, the thing is, God has said every good thing about you He can say. And when God says something, it comes to pass. Isn't that right? Because God doesn't have any doubt. And He believes in His heart and speaks it and it comes to pass. Amen? See, here's one thing you've got to remember. Jesus said, listen, the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. In other words, they have the authority to speak and say, and he said, and you should do what they tell you to do. Isn't that, he said that about the Pharisees. Do what they tell you to do. Just don't do what they do. Because they don't do what they tell you to do. And he called them hypocrites. Why? A hypocrite is an actor. A hypocrite is somebody that tells you to do something that they don't do themselves. Isn't that right? You know, let me ask you this. Was Jesus a hypocrite? Of course not. You know what that means? That means everything he taught you to do and taught his disciples to do, he did himself. Now let me ask you this. He said, Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, you do to them. Isn't that right? Now, did he live by that, or is that just something he put out there? He had to live by it, right? Then that means, if that's how he lived, then that means that every time he saw a sick person, guess what? He had to heal them. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we see? And he healed them all. And he healed them all. And he had compassion and healed them all. Isn't that right? 
That's how Jesus operated. He didn't operate by going, Father, where do I go today? You want me to go down this road or are we going down this road? What do you, which way? Which direction? Where is there a divine appointment waiting for me, God? He didn't say that. You know what he said? He went at the, Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. You know what that means? That word went about literally means wandered around with no set destination. He didn't get up in the morning and go, okay, Father, where are you? Oh, you want to go over here? Okay, I'll go over here. He didn't do that. He got up and went out. And anybody that got in his path, he helped. And it didn't matter if he went that way or went that way. Whichever way he went, he just lived the life. See, we keep trying to say, which path, which path? No, you don't. It's not. The path is due to others that you would have done to you. That's the path. That's the narrow way. That's Matthew chapter 7. Do you understand? It's not about being led where to go. It's about being led wherever you go. You understand what I mean? When you, wherever you go... He's going to bring, he said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will bring to your remembrance everything I've said. So when you're going about your daily business, you're trying to be led to go somewhere. And he's saying, as you go, then you run across somebody and you look at that person and he's going to bring that scripture to remembrance. Whatever you would, the men should do to you, you do to them. You look sick. I got to heal you because I know if I was sick, I'd want to be healed. This is how I live. This is the way we live. This is Bible. This is the way Jesus operated. He didn't operate being led around. He was led by the nature and character of God. And everywhere he went, he just demonstrated what his father was, would do if he were there. He, well, what are you doing? Well, I only do what I see my father do. See right there? He was supposed to, no. In other words, he's saying, if my father was here, you know, I could see him. I know what he would do. He'd heal this guy. So I'm just going to do what I see my father do. Because you look at the word blepo, that, when he said, I only do what I see my father do, it's a Greek word blepo. And it means literally to understand, to perceive. Doesn't mean to see. And so we built up whole doctrines. Well, you can't do it until you see the vision of God. Okay, Jesus never saw the Father come down and heal someone. Because if he did, he didn't need to go heal them. He saw the Father heal them. They're healed. You understand? You see what I'm saying? He just went about doing good. You get in his way, guess what? You get blessed. Isn't that right? And crowds would come. Why? Because they knew. You get to him, you get healed. You get around him, you get healed. The woman with the issue of blood, she didn't even think about it. She goes, if I touch him with a garment, I'm going to get healed. Wasn't even a question. Isn't it right? See, I promise you, I'm doing my best to free you from the religious grave clothes that keep you from stepping out in God because you want to step out. That's why you're here. You don't want, you want to do things for God. Well, the, the thing is, guess what? No, you don't. You don't want to do things for God. You say, yeah, well, yeah, I would do it. Okay, wait. It is God who is in you, both to will and to do His good pleasure. See, that's not even you wanting to do that. That's God in you wanting to do that, and you think it's you. And all the time, you're saying, Lord, lead me. When you say that sick prayer, Lord, I'd sure love to heal them. That's God. You know why? Because you're, in the past, you've been human. Humans are naturally selfish. Humans could technically care less. Matter of fact, you see somebody crippled, you know, you see them in Walmart or somewhere, you're thinking, you know what that means? That means I can get in the line before they get there. See, that's the way, that's the way humans think. Why? Because that's the way the devil thinks. Selfish. Amen? See how simple this stuff is? That's, that's why children can understand this. But children can understand theology. Why? Because God didn't invent it. Right? But children understood it. And that's why Jesus said, Lord, I thank you that you have hidden it from these people, but revealed it to the simple. And you're right. Don't get fancy. I've never seen a fighter get fancy and win. Usually when they get fancy, they make mistakes and somebody knocks them out. That's what happens. It's the simple, direct, it's not pretty, it just works. Amen? That's why, I li see a lot of people don't like what I teach. Why? Too simple. I take all the glamour out of it. 
You know, I take all the pizzazz, all the, you know, I, I, I take the, the name and lights and, you know, be the super anointed person and be the next Benny Hinn. Yeah, I take all that out. Why? Because you're probably not going to be the next Benny Hinn. And while you're waiting to fill stadiums, you're passing by people that are dying. Why? Because you want to be somebody. You want to be the guy on the platform in the stadium with thousands of people. And in reality, you know how you get there? Real simple. The road to the stadium is filled with people that you pray for. And the more people you pray for, God increases your influence. And as you're faithful, He's faithful. And the more you do with the people... See, you want to... I said this down in Birmingham, as a matter of fact. You want to know how to determine a person's greatness in the kingdom? It's really simple. Find where they live. Go to the gas station next to their house. Show that person a picture and say, you know this person? Yeah. How do they treat you when you come in here, when they come in here? Well, I don't even know if they know I exist. Okay, thank you. Go with them to eat. Watch how they treat the server. Right? The greatness of a person is determined not by how they treat their peers, but how they treat people that cannot help them. That's the greatness of a person. Because when you treat a server like they're dirt, that means you think you're better than them. And that just made you least in the kingdom of God. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Defer to them. Treat the server like they're somebody. Because they are. Jesus died for them just like he died for you. Amen? You want to know the greatness of a person? It's how they treat people that can do nothing for them. Not how they treat people that can help them or give an offering. I've had, I've had people... Call, I had John G. Lake's grandson. He's still alive. John G. Lake III. Don't know if I to tell you this or not. <laughs> Might as well now. I've already mentioned the name. He called me on the phone, which is kind of a weird situation. Right? I look at my phone. It says, John G. Lake. You're like, do I want to answer this? <laughs> you know, yeah. Hello? <laughs> you know? And he's in his late 80s. Had some serious physical problems. I'd never met him. I knew Wilfred Wright, Lake's son-in-law, but I'd never met John Lake III. There's other members of his family I've met, but not this one. He knew of me, but didn't know me. Apparently didn't know anything about me. But he, the first thing, he said, I have kidney failure, I'm on dialysis, and unless I get a transplant, I'll be this way the rest of my life. And he said, if you can pray for me and get me healed, he said, I will send you a check for $20,000. And I said, I will pray for you and God will heal you. But do not send me a check and don't offer to pay me to pray for you. I said, what we do, we don't do based on money. I said, the minute I accept something like that, it'll all stop. And I told him, I said, now I'll be glad to pray for you. I said, but keep your money, do something else with it. And he said, well, well I, I, you know, if, if I get healed, I want to help support the ministry. And I said, look, we don't do anything based on money. And he, he didn't get it. I mean, it was hard to get that across. And we prayed for him. God healed him. And, and then he wrote me later, and, you know, I'm healed and I'm going to send you a check. And I'm like, no, you're not. You know, do something else. God will meet our needs. I mean, yeah, honestly, okay, it's a $20,000 check. We could use it. You betcha. But it comes with too high a price. You understand? You can't pay for what I got. And you can't pay me to give you what I got. Good thing is you don't have to. You've got what I've got. You understand? That's what we got to get. But people don't get that. But you have to understand, you can't pay for it. You can't buy it. It is a gift. You understand? I don't mean I have a gift. I'm saying it's a free gift, like salvation. Okay? Now, watch. We were in... Oh, yeah, we got to go back to Ephesians. Sorry. I, well, I, you're probably still there. Let me finish reading this real quick. Because i got to send you... Oh, man. <laughs> Time flies. Okay. Now, watch. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love... Now what's the truth? Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth, right? Spe you know, you can speak the word of God not in love. Right? But speaking the truth in love... Now watch this. May grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, 
even Christ. Now do you hear that? That says that the, five, the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to train us and raise us up until we come to know what he knows, Jesus, and until we, and watch that, until we grow up into him. It doesn't say grow up in him. It says grow up into him. You understand that? Growing up in him, that's a kind of a Christian way of saying, okay, I'm growing up spiritually, it's all good. But when we say grow up into him, now we have an end destination. Right? We can't just say we're just growing and growing. We've got to say we're going to, our destination is that we are going to grow up into him. In other words, when the fivefold ministry truly does its job, the end result is that I will look and talk and act like Jesus in every area. You understand it? You're not going to grow up into something else. You're, when, when God... When the fivefold ministry is done with you, if they do their job right, then you're supposed to look and talk and act like Jesus and be able to do what he did. Because it says to grow up into him in all things. Well, if you're going to grow up into him in all things, that means you're going to grow up into him in character, in attitude, in power. Right? That's all things. So, the scriptures say that we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. You understand? We can go over this. And matter of fact, I did. I don't have it. I did a series out in uh, Denver called "Growing Up Into Him" or "Into Jesus." It's back on the desk, CD and DVD. It was four nights. We went through all of this. That's one of the things. There, there's a few things I would highly recommend you get. That's one of them. Honestly, and I, I'm I'm not here to sell you things. You know, everything back there. If I didn't think it'd help, I, believe me, I wouldn't lug it around in that Tahoe and burn extra gas getting it here. Okay? Which, by the way, my Tahoe, even at this point, I still get 24 miles per gallon in my Tahoe, fully loaded. Alright? That's, that's normal for me. And that's a miracle. Okay? It, I'm, I know. I've talked to people. I tell people, they're like, what? I get 18 on a good day. And I'm like, I get 24 every day. 20, sometimes 26. Why? Because God knows we need all the help we can get. Right? I don't know if he just gives me a tailwind or what. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it works. Amen? Now, i got to send you to break. Hmm. Okay. Where are we at here? <clears throat> yeah. Actually, I'll tell you what. That's what we'll do. Yeah. Speaking the truth and love may grow up in him and all things. That's, that's where you're going, okay? That's, that, if I'm in the fivefold ministry, when I leave you, you should look more like Jesus than I found you. Right? And anybody that you sit under, that doesn't leave you looking more like Jesus, is not in the fivefold ministry. I don't care what title they hold. Alright? If you look less like Jesus when they're done, run. Okay? And if you, if you try to watch it on TV, and they leave you looking less like Jesus, turn that stupid box off, <laughs> get in the Bible, and read it for yourself. Right? You have the teacher, you have the Holy Spirit, He will teach you. Right? You have, no, you have an anointing from the Holy One. You need not that any man teach you anything. But the anointing itself that you have received will teach you all things. And in, you, in Him is no lie. And He will teach you. Right? You, you can know everything I know. The difference is you're getting it in three days instead of 30 years. Right? But now you could take the 30 years and God would show you the same thing. But the fivefold ministry is to turbocharge your growth so you don't have to take so long growing. Right? And you don't have to go through the things I did and make the mistakes I did and all the trial and error. Right? That's the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to grow you up into Him in all things so that you are conformed to the image of Christ. You look like Him, talk like Him, act like Him. Amen? Amen. Go to lunch. Back here at 2 o'clock. I know it. We got about.